Welcome everyone. So I have pleasure to announce the colloquium of uh, Michał Matuszewski. He finished his PhD in 2007 at Warsaw University. Then he spent postdoc in Australia and then he came back to Poland to the Institute of Physics, our big brother. And he's working now on uh, polar returns. Probably many of you know that uh, Bose-Einstein condensate is a uh, gaseous phase which was obtained in uh, very low, at very low temperatures. For gases, yes, these temperatures, they have to be very low, but there are other systems in which you can also observe uh, condensation. And there is a system in which this condensation is happening even at high temperature, even at room temperature. And Michal is a theoretician, but working closely with an experimental group. And I think they have very, very nice results about these other systems. So Michal, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for, for a very nice, uh, uh, invitation and for the invitation to present this, uh, uh, this uh, our work so uh, today I will be talking about uh, some uh, topic that we have been working on for a few years now uh, which is related to um, computing so it is uh, related to optical com computing using exciton polaritons so uh, let me begin with uh, acknowledging uh, my collaborators. So uh, this work um, uh, has been done in collaboration with uh, several groups. Uh, so, um, well, first of all, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of my um, former PhD student, Andrzej Opala, who is uh, currently working in uh, the Institute. Um, and also the experimental group of Barbara Piętka, Jacek Szczytko, in particular, Rafał Mirek and Krzysztof Tyszka, uh, and the experimental group from CNR Nanotechnology in Lecce of Dario Ballarini. Uh, also, we uh, started this uh, work with in, uh, collaborating with Timothy Liu and Sanjeev Ghosh from Singapore. So I would like to start with a brief introduction to neural networks. So I'm aware that many of you are familiar, but just to um, just to um, remind uh, and about neural network and uh, and machine learning. So, what is machine learning? We know that uh, modern computers are extremely efficient in solving many problems, but there are some tasks which are extremely hard to implement using a step-by-step -step algorithm written by a human. For example, it is very difficult to write an algorithm uh, that will recognize an object in an image such as a cat, uh, which can um, be present in very different uh, scenarios, in lighting conditions, and so on. Uh, similarly, it is very difficult to detect uh, fraudulent credit card transactions. There are many other examples, of course. But uh, what is characteristics, uh, characteristic of these problems is that there are very, very um, large number of weak rules that have to be combined to, together in a complex way, uh, and we cannot really follow simple and reliable, reliable rules, such as, for example, taking an intensity of a pixel in this point and in that point and comparing them, uh, multiplying, adding, and so on. On the other hand, these tasks are uh, uh, relatively easy for humans. So, for example, none of us will have any problem uh, telling that there is a cut in each of those photos. So what is the uh, solution to this? Uh, well, the solution is to uh, use machine learning. So instead of writing an algorithm that will perform this task, we write an algorithm that will construct a certain model, for example, a neural network, that will be able to train by itself using a very large number of examples, uh, for example, examples of photos of cats, and construct a model that will be able to, um, to perform this task by itself. So uh, usually uh, one of the most important methods of machine learning is using neural networks. Uh, this uh, um, picture on the right shows an example of a very simple neural network. Uh, and you can see that it is composed of layers. Of, there is input uh, layer, which has several neurons. And in this input layer, we have information about the object, about the sample. So, for example, this can correspond to the pixels intensity and color of pixels in, a, in an image. 
Later, then there is a number of hidden units, and each uh, hidden unit is transforming this information in a nonlinear way. So uh, typically, uh, each of uh, neurons in, in this hidden unit is performing two operations. One operation is summation. So it is taking the information from the previous layer and multiplying it by certain weights. And these weights are actually very important because they uh, determine the task that we are uh, doing. And next, it is uh, transforming this, uh, this result of this uh, operation of summation by, uh, it is transforming by a certain nonlinear tra transformation, function of transformation. So uh, the result of this is uh, mm, taken as an input for the next layer. And the point is of uh, training in this training phase is to um, adjust these weights of, uh, of connections between neurons in each layer in such a way that this whole new network will actually perform this task. So for example, if we have uh, in, at the input, we um, provide information about an uh, image with a cut, uh, then a neuron corresponding to a cut should be activated. So, so the, the activation should be the highest. And if we have, for example, a dog in a photo, maybe neuron corresponding to a dog will be activated. So uh, usually there is, uh, after the training phase, we, when we modify this weight, uh, we can use this network as uh, long as we can in the inference phase, which, in which we no longer modify these weights, uh, but we can still use it for performing this task. And uh, what is important that in this inference phase, uh, this uh, network should be able to uh, recognize objects, for example, um, on samples that it has never seen before. So samples that were not uh, used during training. So for example, if there was no cut in, inside of a, of a bread uh, piece, it should be able to, to recognize it anyway. So uh, there are many applications of machine learning now. Re it is really uh, something that uh, is developing very fast now. So there are a few examples shown here. So for example, for in um, autonomous cars, in uh, speech recognition, uh, fraud prevention, uh, medical diagnosis, but also even when we, ever, every time we are um, performing Google search, we also, this, our query is uh, processed by a neural network. So, but in this talk, I would like to um, uh, say about some limitations of uh, uh, this approach. So actually existing machine learning algorithms require very large amounts of data, and also they consume very large uh, resources. For example, the current uh, Google language model that is used in a Google search engine requires about 5,000 hours of training, which is uh, um, approximately equivalent to, uh, in, in, in terms of electricity and CO2 em emission, to a single passenger trip from New York to San Francisco. Yes, so uh, th this is uh, this is for um, a number for which is given for training. So I agree that when you are working in this inference phase, you no longer have to uh, perform such a large number of. Uh, it is not no, not so expensive. However, the fact is that very often in practical applications, not scientific applications, but in practical applications, actually. Uh, because we are using this model many, many times, so the cost in the inference phase is overcoming the cost in the training. So this is something that usually is uh, not realized by scientists, but for if you look at the um, papers, uh, for example, uh, by engineers, this is pointed out. So, uh, but, uh, okay, so uh, if we look at the uh, cost of, uh, this is actually cost of training, so uh, the first phase, if, and, and if we look at the um, timeline, we see that at the point when we enter this uh, big data um, era, uh, this, uh, um, this trend of exponential growth of, uh, of uh, um, required uh, energy for training is even like more steep. So actually right now, 
Uh, to train the mo most sophisticated uh, models, such as the GPT-3, we, we need to spend um, resources that were equivalent to even to uh, millions of dollars. So, uh, and if we look at the, um, uh, generally at the usage of uh, at the cost of computing in uh, share of computing that is uh, um, in the electricity usage in, uh, globally, we can actually see that depending on the um, prediction, uh, like in the worst case scenario, by 2030, even 50% of electricity and CO2 emissions may be due to, uh, due to uh, computation and communication in general. So this is uh, uh, some, a really important problem. And uh, why is this happening? Well, uh, one reason why this is happening, uh, except from the fact that we are using more and more data and we have access to more data, is that uh, we are no longer uh, following uh, Moore's law. So Moore's law is a law which predicted that uh, the number of transistors per chip is, uh, will be exponentially growing every, let's say, in different versions of the law every uh, a year or two years, it will be the number of uh, computation power will be doubled. So, if we look at the, what is hap happening, actually, well, maybe we can s still say that we are uh, can put more and more transistors on a chip. But if you look, we look at the um, performance, uh, like measured in terms of uh, clock speed, this actually saturated uh, many years ago already. And this is uh, related to the breakdown of the so-called Dinard scaling, which is a phenomenological uh, law based on, uh, let's say, dimensional analysis under some uh, assumptions, which says that as we increase, as we make the transistor smaller and smaller, we increase the density of transistors, the power uh, that we need to expand per uh, millimeter square of silicon is constant. So in the past, if we were able to create a technology which could put more transistors on a chip. At the same time, we improved uh, energy efficiency. But this is actually no longer the case uh, since about 2006. So if this law was uh, true, this uh, power per, per surface should be constant. But we can see that uh, actually it is uh, very far from this trend already. So what is the uh, what can we do about it? Well, uh, one of the solutions to w that are considered is uh, neuromorphic computing, which is uh, the concept based on such an observation that uh, artificial neural networks that we are using now are based, based uh, on computer simulation. So the network structure exists only virtually in computer memory. But if we are able to um, create a physical computational model which in which uh, the structure is resembled in hardware somehow, it should be bring benefits of efficiency. Why? Uh, because uh, modern computing is based on uh, so-called von Neumann architecture. In this architecture, we have a separate uh, processing unit such as CPU or GPU and separate memory units which are connected with a bus. So all the information is, uh, has to be transported back and forth. And actually, in uh, um, applications such as machine learning, which require a lot of data to be processed, the cost of this uh, um, transport of information is actually overcoming any cost of computation. And uh, this limits both the speed and the efficiency of, uh, of um, computing. So this is uh, known as uh, von Neumann bottleneck. So uh, mm, there have been many uh, mm, already uh, applications, realizations of this neuromorphic computing idea in electronics uh, systems. One of the first one, uh, successful ones were, was the TrueNorf chip from IBM, uh, in which uh, and the structure of this chip is shown here. So you can see that it doesn't have a typical structure of uh, separate uh, processing and memory unit. Instead, there are uh, some kind of cells in which processing units, some neurons, are very close, physically very close to synapses, which are memory units. And the communication between uh, different uh, parts of the system is uh, 
still performed by, by uh, channels, but the uh, amount of communication, cost of communication is much reduced because most uh, neurons and their weights are very close to each other physically. So this allowed to reduce uh, power consumption by about uh, a factor 100 uh, with respect to uh, CPU. So there are many other um, projects which realize this concept. But in this talk, I would like to uh, talk about photons. So the question is, can we use photons to, for computations, not electrons? Well, um, in principle, yes. But uh, we need to take into account that uh, electrons are excellent for information processing because uh, um, there are substantial interactions between electrons. On the other hand, then we also have high losses, high losses due to this communication. On the other hand, photons are very good in communication of information. This is why we are using fibers for communication on long distances. But the problem is that photons are interacting quickly and only in nonlinear media. And um, on the other hand, we have relatively low losses. But we actually need this inform uh, these interactions uh, to have any kind of processing of information. For example, to construct a transistor or a neuron with nonlinear uh, activation function, we need to have nonlinearity. But uh, the concept of optical neural networks is actually not uh, new. Uh, even in the 70s, there was a um, physical realization of an optical uh, network. Well, maybe this was not really a neural network, but it was an experiment that realized a vector matrix multiplication, uh, which this idea comes from the fact that if, if we look at Maxwell equations, this Maxwell propagation of light uh, can be mapped into uh, exactly into vector matrix multiplication. So we can understand it simply by the fact that if we have a number of light sources which encode a vector and a mask which encodes elements of the matrix, and if we um, have a certain uh, um, uh, configuration of optical lenses uh, which directs this light in, in a way that is shown here, then the light uh, which arrives at photodetectors on the other side will exactly be uh, the result of the intensity of light will exactly be the result of vector matrix multiplication. And this is important because uh, this is a very important uh, um, operation and it is actually at the core of neural networks as well. So, but anyway, this was a long time ago, but we never had any examples of uh, practical uh, optical computing uh, commercial uh, commercially developed. So wh why was that? Well, one of the reasons was that the electronics were developing so fast, according to more so. Uh, electronics were universal, whereas photonic devices were uh, only specific for, sp uh, for certain operation. Uh, they were not practical because optical elements were bulky, uh, while electronics could be integrated. And finally, apart from communication, like in optical fibers, the practical advantage of photonics uh, has never been demonstrated. Uh, but currently this uh, is changing. So as I showed, uh, Moore's law is no longer valid. There is a growing need for application-specific devices. For example, GPUs and TPUs are, is, are um, uh, specialized in certain operations. Photonics can be uh, integrated on a chip, uh, even on silicon chip. And the advantage of photonics is uh, likely to be demonstrated in the near future. So I, I will show now uh, several examples of such uh, systems that have been developed recently. So for example, this, um, this, work, uh, this works um, show the application of uh, silicon optics. So we can, as you can see, we can imprint on a chip certain uh, paths for light, waveguides uh, on a micrometer scale that realized, uh, can realize, for example, vector matrix multiplication. Uh, and the advantage of this approach is that we can uh, have uh, this system integrated. Uh, the linear operations are realized very uh, efficiently. Basically, there is the cost is, uh, of uh, propagation of light is uh, very low. 
However, the disadvantage is that optical nonlinearity has not been implemented, and the uh, scalability of the system is limited. Uh, also, uh, losses are in waveguides are relatively high. Nevertheless, this um, concept uh, attracted a lot of interest also from the industry, and now we have uh, many startups, and among them uh, these two uh, that are based on, on these chips. So another uh, concept is to use simply uh, propagation in free space. So instead of using integrated system, we use just free space system. And to uh, um, uh, have a number of uh, masks for light, in such a configured in such a way that the propagation of light between these masks correspond to layers, subsequent layers of neural networks. So again, the advantages is that the linear operation is slow, the implementation is easy, but on the other hand, we have low number of independently tunable parameters and nonlinearity is has not been yet implemented. Uh, another very interesting concept is to use uh, mm, uh, homodyne detection as a method for uh, achieving nonlinearity. So here we also have a propagation in free space, but uh, at, at the detector uh, layer, we have a certain configuration of uh, homodyne detection, which provides nonlinear response to uh, of uh, electrical output in uh, function of optical input. So here, um, uh, this nonlinearity can be implemented uh, very efficiently, but still, uh, to this, uh, there is a need for digital to analog and electronic to optical conversion at each layer of of a, of a neural network. So uh, another example is this is a um, final example where we have an all optical system where uh, actually the light was uh, it, uh, optical nonlinearity was used for uh, implementing both the uh, summation and this nonlinear transformation in a neural network, which allowed to uh, get rid of this optical to electronic conversion. Uh, however, as you can see, the size of this chip is quite large, and so scalability is not maybe great, and the energy cost uh, of optical nonlinearity is was relatively high. So uh, now I would like to move to polariton neural networks. Why polariton neural networks? Well, well as I mentioned, uh, the, mm, this uh, Achilles foot of uh, photons for computation is that they are interacting very weakly. So the question is, uh, can we have substantial interactions and low communication losses at the same time? Actually, uh, polaritons are, uh, is an ideal platform for this because polaritons are uh, hybridized uh, quasi-particles where we have photons and, and close in a microcavity, uh, which interact strongly with excitons. So excitons are electron hole pairs, which are uh, trapped in a quantum well. And if we put these two in resonance and make sure that the decoherence rate of photons and excitons are sufficiently low, uh, lower than the, than the coupling rate of excitons and photons, then we uh, get hybridized uh, quasi-particles which have properties of both photons and excitons. So you can say that this uh, polaritons are uh, kind of like Schrodinger cut states for which, in which we have exciton or a photon in a system. So, uh, but what is important from practical point of view is that these po polaritons have excellent transport properties thanks to this very low effective mass of photons in a microcavity. And on the other hand, they are characterized by very strong interparticle interactions thanks to this matter component. So actually this nonlinearity is uh, many orders of magnitude stronger than in, uh, in the case of traditional optical nonlinearity. So to describe the system uh, in a theoretically, we can use uh, in, at this uh, simplest level, we can use such a Hamiltonian where we have uh, excitons that can be to a good approximation modeled as a bosonic particles. Uh, we have photons, which are also bosons, and we have a uh, simple Rabi coupling between them. So now if we, uh, this Hamiltonian can be easily diagonalized uh, with this um, matrix formulation. And now if you look at the dispersion relations, uh, it, look, it uh, looks like this. So in a cavity, photons uh, have parabolic dispersion. So because this is 
this uh, k parallel is the momentum of the photons in the plane of the cavity and we also have momentum in, in which is uh, correspond to, to this standing wave so altogether in we, if we plot this uh, energy of photons in function of k parallel we get a, par a parabolic dispersion so uh, photons uh, uh, in a cavity acquire a mass on the other hand excitons are also massive particles but their mass is much much uh, higher so this is why this uh, curve here is almost flat if we now turn on the coupling between excitons and photons we get two we get anti-crossing and we have two modes one is called upper polariton and another one is called lower polariton uh, of course these two uh, hybridized modes have um, uh, like are mixed states of both excitons and photons uh, so uh, there have been many proposed applications of uh, exciton polaritons in many different contexts, such as in as uh, transistors, uh, and, um, lasers, uh, topological lasers, detectors, and also simulators of uh, certain quantum systems, quantum and classical systems. And uh, we propose that they can be also used uh, for realization of optical neural networks. Okay, so these are just some examples of what uh, has been done in the past with polaritons, uh, for example, with uh, realizing transistors. But uh, our uh, concept uh, was the following. We wanted to build a neural network using these polaritons, but how to do this? Uh, well, uh, we uh, chose to use this uh, reservoir computing approach. So what is that? Uh, well, this is a kind of a neural network which has a very uh, uncommon structure so here as you can see we have input layer we have this information coming from the uh, from the um, from in the input we have uh, something like uh, one hidden layer which is composed of many interconnected nodes that are uh, connected in sort of random way and we have an output layer and the point here is that if when we are training the network we are only modifying the weights in, the, in this output layer. This uh, middle layer, which is called reservoir, is not changed at all. So it can be just uh, static, completely like maybe random. Um, so this uh, concept is kind of inspired by the structure of the brain. So what is the point of this, uh, this big reservoir, which is not trained? Uh, does it have any function? Maybe we could connect this input directly to the output layer. And, but the point, the point is that it turns out that the fact that there is an, a reservoir inside can improve this, uh, mm, this uh, neural network results a lot. So actually, because each of these nodes are nonlinear, and they are transforming this input system to a kind of like mm, higher, much higher dimensional space because the number of nodes here is assumed to be higher, much higher than the number of input nodes. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, nonlinearity in each, each node, so this transformation is very nonlinear. So then this output layer can read out this information that, uh, it, uh, that is relevant and uh, use it for uh, realizing, realizing a particular task. So our uh, concept was to, to model this, a polariton system such as here, which is basically a lattice of nodes. So each of this, there, this is like a number of pillars which are uh, overlapping with each other. And each pillar is a node of a lattice. So uh, we have, uh, we have uh, like hopping of uh, polaritons between the pillars, which is modeled by uh, this term. We assume that we have a resonant injection, possibly to inject light resonantly from the outside using a laser. And we also take into account uh, uh, losses in the system um, due to, for example, limited uh, um, reflectivity of, of the mirrors in each pillar. And uh, we have also interaction. So um, the cavity in each of the pillar, each pillar is actually a micro cavity. So there are two, two mirrors, one on the bottom, one on the top, and the quantum well inside. So this is actually the correspond to the figure that I showed before. So the concept was the following. Let's say that we want to uh, realize some machine learning tasks, such as recognition of handwritten digit. We inject this information into the lattice, 
And then we, uh, we look at the activation functions, uh, evolution of activation functions in time. And we, so we monitor the, what is uh, the emission from each of these pillars in time. And we use this information to realize this output layer. So this is our reservoir, this is our output layer, and this output layer is realized in a computer in software in such a way, so we minimize the weights of uh, this output layer, uh, modify the weights of this output layer in such a way to minimize this cost function. And it turns out that, uh, that it works. Uh, we were able to process, for example, this 110 digit data set with uh, up to 95% accuracy in, in a simulation. And uh, what is interesting is that uh, this accuracy de depends on the actually the, the ratio of losses to pumping. So if the ratio of losses to pumping, which is uh, described by, in our model by parameter gamma, is zero, so we are very close to the, to the condensation threshold, so, so this uh, which corresponds to Bose-Einstein condensation of, of polaritons, which are bosons, this uh, system performs the best. So this is something that is actually known in this theory of reservoir computing, that when you are close to some kind of threshold of stability or phase transition, uh, the system has the highest computational capabilities. So uh, according to our estimations, we could uh, predict that thanks to this very high nonlinearity of polaritons, everything is happening on a very short time scale of picoseconds. So this is why we are able in principle to process a lot of uh, information uh, um, on a very short time scale compared to other um, such as electronic applications. So now I would like to describe uh, experiments that we uh, mm, that our collaborators uh, have performed. So uh, this uh, first experiment was realized in the group of Daro Ballarini and Daniel Sanvito in Lecce. And basically it followed our idea, but uh, here instead of time dependent signals, they used uh, encoding in space using a spatial light modulator. So basically uh, this uh, spatial light modulator encoded this 100 and digit. Uh, this uh, light was directed to a sample, the mic micro cavity that hosts uh, polaritons. And this sample is performing this nonlinear transformation. So we can see that the dependence of output power on the input power for each node is a very nonlinear function of... Uh, so this uh, provides nonlinearity and the output is monitored in, on the CCD camera and then processed uh, this uh, final weight matrix is implemented in, uh, uh, in software. So we uh, obtained a very uh, high, uh, well, very high, as for a hardware application, it was uh, quite high recognition rate, about 93% of, uh, of digits. And what is important that this is uh, accuracy that, that is higher than the so-called uh, linear um, linear threshold, linear regression threshold, which basically this corresponds to the situation where uh, ideal situation where we have only this input directly um, um, uh, connected to the output. So this nonlinear transformation by reservoir is not performed. So if our result is higher, then we can uh, see that the fact that we have this reservoir is actually helping the system to achieve higher accuracy. And also, uh, in comparison to other platforms that were um, developed in the past, uh, our system has not only high accuracy, but also the potential uh, speed, which is very high, because of this picosecond time scales of polaritons, we can think of terahertz uh, mm, clock rate for, for such uh, application. Of course, this was not the case in our system, because this spatial light modulator was uh, limited to, let's say, mm, millisecond time scales, but in principle, using a different uh, tool for encoding information, we can reach higher uh, rates. So uh, the second uh, experiment was realized in, uh, in Warsaw in the group of Barbara Pientka. And uh, here, the, uh, our idea was that to use uh, the concept of binary RS network. Binary RS network is a concept from the machine learning um, community which appeared several uh, years ago, 
Uh, and it basically is based on the fact that if we used instead for information encoding, instead of using continuous variables, we use binary uh, states, just zero and one. In many tasks, we can uh, still perform this task with a very high accuracy, but we gain a lot in terms of efficiency because we don't need to uh, process all these bits of information. So a uh, mm, basic building block of a binarized network is a neuron performing just uh, an exclusive or operation. Why exclusive op or operation? Because we need nonlinearity. And exclusive or, or operation is a very nonlinear operation. Uh, this can be understood uh, on such a simple diagram where we see uh, the result, which is marked by the color. Orange is one and blue is zero. Uh, in function of the mm, values on two inputs, X and Y. So we see that uh, we cannot divide this space by a, a straight line. So we cannot perform simple linear, um, linear classification to distinguish between the results zero and one. We need to add another feature, a nonlinear feature that uh, will allow us to move to a three dimensional space or a feature space. And here we can actually perform this operation with 100% accuracy. So uh, we re realized this network in a, um, in a polariton, uh, using a polariton condensation. So the, the um, concept was to uh, have this input sequence as a sequence of uh, light pulses with high or low intensity. These were um, femtosecond pulses. And uh, the, if the two pulses arrived at the same time, uh, condensation uh, happened. So uh, in function of uh, an input energy, this photoluminescence from the cavity, uh, as you can see, is a very nonlinear function, uh, which uh, reminds of the rectified linear unit uh, function for neural networks. So um, this allowed us to uh, achieve 96% uh, accuracy in this 100-digit data set, which is comparable to other uh, state-of-the-art uh, neuromorphic uh, realizations. And what is important, nonlinear transformation was, which is usually very hard uh, using optics, was uh, performed entirely with optical elements. And we also measured the efficient energy efficiency of such a, um, of such a system using a simple setup where we uh, realized an all optical uh, exclusive OR gate by um, using additional channels of light which were not passing through the microcavity and the spectral filter which provided a negative differential response or in, of uh, output uh, photoluminescence in function of input. So in this way we were able to construct an on-optical uh, neuron which was uh, with energy efficiency of uh, 16 picojoule per synaptic operation. So uh, this is, of course, uh, the only optical energy. So it doesn't take into account all the electronics that we used for this experiment and, I don't know, co cost of cooling. Uh, but it shows that there is potential for outperforming electronics because 16 picojoules is actually the same as uh, efficiency of the uh, most energy efficient currently supercomputer uh, frontier. So uh, another, uh, another uh, experiment uh, was focused on uh, so-called spiking neurons. So what is spiking neuron? It is a neuron which uh, is resembling the, uh, the physics of a biological neuron. So a biological neuron uh, is performing operation, summation and nonlinear response operations, but in a different way. It doesn't have just channels of uh, numbers which uh, with simple sum and activation as, as in a uh, typical artificial neural network, but it is, um, it is uh, excited by a series of spikes. Uh, there is some kind of, it, which uh, excite uh, the membrane potential. When the membrane potential overcomes some threshold, this uh, neuron fires and uh, sends information to, to, uh, to the output. Uh, so we, what we uh, notice is that actually the condensation of polaritons uh, has physics which are very similar to uh, physics of this uh, membrane potential. So uh, because this is because both the condensation of polaritons is a very highly nonlinear phenomenon. So uh, 
this can be shown here, so uh, in these two figures. So for example, here is a figure where we excite uh, this, uh, this uh, microcavity sample with two pulses. So there is some response. Let's say first pulse is uh, below threshold. The second pulse is also below threshold. Do we have some response? This is where these pulses come separately. But we, if we uh, have these pulses together and we cross the threshold for condensation, there is a very strong spike of emission. And actually, this is much stronger than shown in this figure because this is uh, this uh, uh, but this curve was decreased 20 times just to show show this to uh, other spikes. So uh, mm, you can see that there is an mm, analogy to human neuron where we have uh, some kind of spikes which are exciting the potential, but when the potential reaches the threshold, the, there is a firing of uh, uh, emission to the next uh, to next neuron, neurons. So if we compare human neurons to our polariton neurons, the, we have energy efficiency that is uh, uh, better. Firing time is, of course, much, much shorter uh, because it turns in comparison to milliseconds. But uh, the problem what we have, of course, is scalability. So we uh, not all firing events are the same. Uh, in, in the case of human neurons, they are approximately the same. And also, uh, well, so far we only realized uh, a single neuron. So we are on the, um, we need to, uh, we are now working on connecting many neurons. So I just wanted to advertise that this work that's uh, just last week. And now uh, in the final uh, part of my talk, I wanted to um, discuss uh, the outlook for, for polariton neuron networks. So why do we think that they are actually promising? We think they are promising because uh, polaritons are very highly nonlinear uh, optical systems. So, if we look, uh, if we think of a um, useful operation, we uh, need to get uh, a nonlinear phase shift of about pi to realize, for example, complete uh, using a Maxander interferometer. If we have pi phase shift, we can completely block the pulse, uh, so realize some kind of gate. Uh, so this corresponds to uh, approximately to the condition that the nonlinear interaction inside uh, this cavity of polaritons is higher than the lifetime of polaritons. This, and this is about four orders of magnitude lower with polaritons than with other nonlinear media. It's about three attojoules. So we, uh, this, we propose a theoretically uh, a system which could realize uh, um, Polariton single uh, hidden layer polariton network using this concept, um, which realized very high efficiency in uh, inference phase, not the training phase, but the inference phase. And uh, we, uh, to get a realistic estimate, we took into account the uh, cost of the both the laser light source, modulators, detectors, and optical losses. So everything that is could provide uh, losses. And we considered two cases, an idealized case where we took parameters of all the devices that we, the best that we could find in the literature and a proof of principle system with a small number of nodes and uh, parameters of elements that uh, you can basically buy uh, on the internet. Uh, in, in both cases, we, we can see that potential energy efficiency and performance density, so the number of operations per second per surface, is actually high, potentially can be higher than, than in the case of uh, electronics and other systems. And uh, this is actually not uh, everything because um, as noticed in, uh, in, in this work, uh, in, in many neural network models, neurons have thousands of inputs. So the cost of nonlinear activation that is performed by, by polaritons can be divided between inputs. So uh, actually it was noted that if we have such a neuron, which has many inputs, we can even have less than one photon per, per uh, input to realize an accurate uh, neural network. And this was actually shown recently also experimentally. So uh, mm, we proposed that we could, uh, uh, that one could build an, a neural network that uh, schematically is shown here. So we have electronic input layer because we need to take information from some kind of uh, database or a computer 
Uh, but if we have all the hidden layers, all the nodes in the hidden layers uh, rise optically, then we can gain uh, a lot of uh, in terms of energy consumption if the number of neurons here in this uh, hidden layer is much larger than in the input and output layer. And actually, uh, this is the case in the, in the many uh, practical applications of neural networks. For example, if we look at uh, some uh, of the best uh, models for image recognition, uh, the number of hidden nodes is much, much higher than the, than the number of pixels in, a, in an image. And also we can think of uh, human brain as a, a system which has very large hidden layer, which, uh, which has number of neurons is much, much larger than basically the dimensionality of uh, information that is coming uh, from outside. So if we uh, take into account uh, that uh, we have such a uh, large uh, model with large hidden layer and uh, mm, put some uh, numbers that are uh, realistic for, um, for large uh, neural network models, uh, we can think of, so uh, if we uh, look at the, uh, the literature and compare the potential efficiency of polaritons, uh, the cost per uh, activation function and for uh, for the um, multiply and accumulate operation uh, can be uh, even in the the region of uh, zepto joules which is of course many many orders of magnitude lower than in the case of uh, elect current electronic uh, systems so uh, of course to achieve that we need to overcome many uh, challenges uh, and uh, so uh, first of all, we need to demonstrate experimentally a large-scale network. So, so far, the largest network that we realized physically consists of about uh, 60 neurons, which is not enough, definitely. Uh, we need to uh, have room temperature operation. So, instead of calcium arsenide, for example, we can consider uh, two-dimensional materials, perovskites, organic materials. There are many examples of systems, uh, materials where Polaritons can exist at room temperature, and uh, can so uh, of course if we want to go for multi-layer networks, we need to have some um, way of uh, signal regeneration and fan out, and uh, of course we need efficient input-output interface between electronics and opt optics. But this point actually is uh, the same for any kind of optical uh, neural network. Okay, so this this is all. So uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now we have uh, time for questions. Was the first question already? There is this famous uh, uh, the lowest cost for processing information, uh, known as the Landauer criterion. Uh, should I understand that even your almost perfect way of uh, processing information is still much, much more costly than this thermodynamic limit? Yes, that's, that's a very good point. So uh, actually, um, this uh, Landauer criterion, so okay, uh, the, the um, experiment that we have done so far, of course, there are much, much higher than the Landauer limit. But if we look at potential limits of uh, optical computation, uh, they are actually not limited with the Landauer, uh, at least not uh, mm, the cost of uh, multiple, uh, multiple accumulate operation is not limited by the Landauer limit because the Landauer limit concerns of operations which are not reversible. And uh, actually it, in this case of uh, optical summation of uh, and multiplication of input signals for the neuron, this is operation which is just propagation of light and interference. So this is a reversible operation. This uh, nonlinear operation, which is uh, realized by, uh, by nonlinearity, uh, um, I think this is limited by the Landauer. So we cannot go below that uh, limit. But this uh, actually does not prevent, uh, in the case of Cepso Joule uh, cost, which is very, very low, this is still uh, not uh, uh, below this Landauer limit. So what actually is the temperature? Because you said that it's cooled. So what's the temperature there? It's not room temperature, no? Yes. So uh, up to now, uh, this uh, all these uh, uh, experiments that I showed, they were performed in liquid helium because this was gallium arsenide, which 
and excitons do not exist in room temperature, they, they just break down. But actually there are many other materials uh, where condensation of polaritons uh, were, was achieved at room temperature, for example, in zinc oxide, in two-dimensional materials, perovskites and organic materials. So now we are working on uh, moving to these materials. Mm -hmm. Other other questions? So, so it was a very nice talk. Uh, I'm completely new in this topic. Uh, I have a question regarding the neural networks with uh, you called reservoir. Uh, I think the key point in, in, in this approach is that you have to make sure that this reservoir is very stable because if I understand correctly, you tune this this last layer exactly to this reservoir. So it has to be, apart from anything else, it needs to be very stable because small changes will ruin everything. Mm -hmm. Is it correct? Yes, uh, but uh, y yes, you are absolutely right. So uh, every time if, if I uh, introduce some change, even in a single node of the reservoir, uh, I probably need to retrain all this uh, output layer. But uh, usually this is not a problem because uh, usually when physical implementations of this reservoir are uh, performed, this uh, reservoir is uh, implemented in a, in a physical system that is basically not changed. It is not, uh, the parameters are not changing in any way. This can be just, uh, you know, like a lattice with uh, fixed micropillars. So the coupling between micropillars is not changing. Uh, in, in uh, well, of course, temperature variations can change, but uh, these effects are usually not uh, not important. Um, actually, what in this experiment that we did, what was more uh, important was the stability of the, the laser source. So this was more more a problem than stability of the system itself. And there's a question. I have a kind of a question, not really related to the physics of that, but rather to the socio-economical impact. Actually, uh, big data uh, promised a lot, but uh, I think most effort goes into optimization of processes which are relevant for uh, increasing income of big companies, but much less relevant to ordinary people. You mentioned, of course, application in medical diagnostic, but I don't think it's a mainstream application of big data, really. It's important and may improve quality of life of people, but I don't think this is the uh, why all this uh, quest is going on. So on the other hand, I see here something like a limit of growth of computational uh, possibilities of humans because of energy which has to be invested to compute more data and faster and so uh, i don't know whether in your community th 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 these issues are uh, considered uh, as well uh, uh, what is uh, assuming your project, your your physics is successful and you uh, provide a much better and much more efficient uh, processor. What kind of achievement will it uh, do for uh, or improvement for ordinary people given, I mean, the current situation on earth, so to speak? Mm -hmm. So, okay, so this question is uh, a little bit uh, away from my expertise because I'm just a physicist who is working on uh, on uh, specific models. But, um, well, in my opinion, uh, machine learning is uh, still at the infancy of applications, possible applications, and we will see much more. So every year uh, we can see more um, really impressive uh, things that uh, this uh, ma machine learning can do so not of course not all of them can be considered as uh, beneficial for general uh, public for example this year there is uh, was a huge news about uh, um, about uh, um, for example dali and midjourney uh, models uh, able to generate uh, artistic uh, images from a text. So this, uh, of course, is a concern because now graphic designers uh, and artists are worried because th th they will lose their job, basically. But on the other hand, the Chinese government has all the recognition of all the 
inhabitants of the country. Yes, so this is also an issue because uh, China has no regulations on collecting information and if uh, you have more information available, you can get a more accurate models. So this is definitely an issue. On the other hand, there are topics like new medicine designs, right? Yes. It's so very important for humanity. So uh, actually... The question uh, is how much of that power and money goes into better algorithm for Facebook. Yeah, so... And how much goes into better design for, for medicine, right? Oh. No, but then it was a, a, a little bit of, 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 of I mean, humanity was at the wall, basically. Right? Yeah, so, so I don't know. I can uh, mention many uh, applications of neural networks that are that we are using. For example, every time we use uh, a phone, uh, we, we uh, every time we perform a Google search, every time we you use our speech to um, to talk to our phone every time we're using uh, I don't translation uh, online translation uh, so there are really many uh, practical applications I don't know if, if uh, for yes of course this Facebook algorithms uh, and and so on they are benefiting mostly the companies and not everyday people uh, everyone but uh, I think there are also many applications that me, we maybe not even know about that are uh, fueled by uh, machine learning. Yes, I think it's going to the discussion to well, something beyond physics, yes. definitely, which would be a good topic for a break and further discussions after the talk. So now I propose, as we are running out of time, to thank the speaker again. Thank you very much.